listening to The New Paris. I'm your host, Lindsay Tremuda. Welcome to season six. I can't actually believe I've been recording this for that long, but here we are. I'm excited for a new year of interesting guests and conversations, and I'm especially happy to kick things off with some talk about wine. If you were to scan a Parisian city block, you'll land on at least one caviste or wine cellar. But while there are a lot of them, they're not all created equal. Alison Eastway, an Australian who has lived in Paris for 12 years and also today's guest, saw an opportunity to offer something different. She left her last career in tech to start Cave Woman Wines, a wine store and tasting room in the 11th arrondissement that she opened last July. On today's show, we talk about non-linear career paths, the impetus for opening Cave Woman Wines, and some of her favorite producers. Good morning, Alison. Thanks for joining. Good morning, Lindsay. Thanks for having me. I met you uh, over Zoom <laughs> a couple years ago uh, when you were still working in tech and I was doing a project uh, involving the French tech. Um, you've since done quite a big shift in your career. Uh, before we get to that, though, I'm kind of interested in what brought you to, to Paris in the first place. And, and was it for tech? Was it for something else? How does one find themselves all the way from Australia in Paris in tech? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question and one that I think the longer you stay in Paris, the more kind of threads of the narrative you end up drawing together. But I think the truest answer is back in 2009, I came to Paris for sort of lack of a better idea. Um, and, you know, I'd always read books about Paris um, as a kid, particularly about sort of like the writers and the lifestyle. Um, and the food, food's a big part of my life. Um, but to com be completely honest, I sort of booked the tickets uh, for a month, one month trip, um, kind of out of the blue and, and then ended up staying and thought, well, I'll stay for a year. And then one year turned into almost 12 uh, this September. Yeah, it is. It is often the, the story it's that, you know, people come for a year and then life sort of adapts or you you adapt to a different life and then have trouble imagining you know living any other way um I, I i did see i remember seeing this um on linkedin that you talked about having an atypical path and that it wasn't sort of obvious that you would land in tech in the first place what what does that mean yeah yeah absolutely i've had a ton of jobs um and uh, you know we'd probably need a lot longer than than this uh, this podcast to go through them all, but you know a few a few kind of samplings. I worked as a nanny. I worked as a tour guide. I worked as an English language teacher. I've been a waitress for a lot of years of my life. Um, more recently, I was a human resources director in some tech startups. Um, and you know, today I, I have a wine store. And at first glance, particularly from a French point of view, it looks like those jobs have absolutely nothing in common. Um, and I'd probably argue that they have a ton of stuff in common um, and that each job sort of allowed me to springboard into the next by sort of taking the skills I'd learned. You know, for example, say as a waitress, um, a lot of the waitressing skills are actually very useful when you're a tour guide. Um, they wouldn't necessarily be logical hiring pools from one job to the next. Um, but, you know, things like uh, antip anticipating people's needs, things like being comfortable speaking in front of strangers, you know, organization, project management, um, all of those skills are kind of as common uh, to a waitress, to a tour guide as they are to a human resources director. Um, and I think I've just always sort of navigated my career by saying, well, what do I know how to do already and what do I want to do and how can I sort of parlay those existing skills into this new interesting thing that I'd love to discover and learn about um, and you know, that's sort of how I somersaulted my way into tech. Um, I worked as an English language teacher um, for a digital company um, that most French people would know, uh, Le Bon Coin. Um, and basically, I, as their English teacher, kept sort of jumping in and saying, oh, have, have you thought about doing um, this a little bit differently in your human resources team? Because I was teaching English to people in that team. Or to the CEO, have you thought about sort of this angle on your board presentation? Um which, you know, is just my natural way of not being able to keep any opinion to myself. Um, and it sort of <laughs> turned into, you know, why, why don't you actually do this job? Um, and, you know, sort of working in HR in a digital company, um, but that still had sort of, you know, was 10 years old at the time, sort of led me into, oh, well, what if you could do this from scratch? Um, and that led me into early stage startups where 
rather than saying, hey, do you mind if we change this? People would say, go for it, um, just get it done and let me know when it's done, which is really a kind of a way of functioning that really suits my personality. That's wild because as I'm sure, well, I mean, this is of no surprise to you, but maybe for some listeners, um, you know, it's very hard to sort of uh, upsell uh, to French companies all of the experiences that are uh, not precisely in line with whatever you're applying for. And and even the idea of sort of working your way up. I mean, you you know, you hear stories about people working in Hollywood and they started out in the mail room and then they, you know, they, they end up as talent agents or whatever. And that kind of story is so uncommon here just because they don't really leave a lot of room for all of these diverse experiences. But you came in and you you just showed them essentially that you could do it. Yeah, I think, and that's extremely Anglo-Saxon uh, writers to come in and say, well, give me two weeks. W- worst case, what are you going to lose? Um, and right. the French uh, like employment law system is not at all set up for, for that. Although in, in a way, and this is kind of the, the loophole, I guess I used in my favor is to say, you know, anybody in France who works on a full-time contract has a trial period. Um, and I would just say, let's, let's just be really honest about this trial period. Bring me on. Uh, it doesn't work out. We're both going to know it at more or less the same time. So let's just sort of forge ahead. But I know even that, um, approach to things is not very French. I think, um, I think the French are catching up. Um, I think particularly the tech industry, uh, and that was one of kind of the things that I sort of took upon myself in my role. Um, you know, I did a lot of hiring, um, over the last five years and I wanted to make sure I sort of hadn't, forged this unusual path just for myself and then gone back and replicated all of the old models for everyone else. Um, so we were particularly careful in the startups I worked at to never ask for a university degree unless it was, you know, for example, for a certified accountant where we needed specific um, sort of regimented things. But other than that, we would never ask for a university degree. We wouldn't specify years of experience. We would try really hard um, to kind of look adjacent um, and into different industries when we were sourcing um, and I felt like that was starting, that approach was starting to get traction outside of just the startups that I was working in. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of other startup founders. You know, I, I guess necessity creates um, that sort of shift uh, and everybody was struggling to hire. This is obviously pre-pandemic um, and pre kind of the era we're in right now. Um, and particularly when it came to sort of entry level salespeople, um, everybody was sort of hiring out of, and particularly in the, in the US for French startups, we were hiring sort of you know, the head of the sports team at a university. And, and that was the lowest hanging fruit where we could say, well, what if actually, um, you know, there's a ton of potential to hire people out of other industries who might have sort of a decade experience in the service industry, but would love um, to be working in something a little bit more stable, a little bit more mm-hmm. comfortable, like the tech industry. And, and so we did a few of those kind of mindset shifts as well that I felt the industry was really starting to get on board with. And certainly there's a lot of foreign talent already in the tech scene, which probably helps make that shift sort of naturally because you're adapting. Also, if you need certain skill sets from people who have already experienced, um, you know, what do we call that? Not not to stage stage A. What do we call those? The, the series, series A. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my, my tech vocabulary is a little rusty. Um, you know, where you're, where you're trying to fundraise and, um, or, or raise seed money and then perhaps sell or, you know, would it go public or whatever it is? You know, you need people who have already experienced that in some other country, perhaps. So, you know, anyway, I'm not teaching you anything new, but so then what happens? How do you, how do you go from this sort of very, um, solid experience or solid uh, foundation in tech working with people and talent to saying, you know what, I'm done with this chapter. I live in Paris. I'm going to do, I'm going to get into wine. What what was that? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm obviously bastardizing the process, but <laughs> just like what, what was that? Exp- what was that shift? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'll, and I'll always sort of say this, you know, I'm not an engineer. Um, I'm not a software engineer and, and the upside, and I think, Personally, for me, that's a great thing. Um, the upside of that is that um, my job wasn't inherently linked to tech. I happened to the things I knew how to do um, made a lot of sense in the context of tech and particularly in the boom that we were sort of going through um, in Europe and, and, and the larger world at the time. Um, but my skills are, are, are people skills um, and organizational skills and kind of understanding how systems work together and, and uh, orchestrating all of that. Um, 
And a lot of people think that might be a very narrow sort of scope. And if you know how to do human resources, well, that's about all you're good for. And, and I happen to take the very opposite view, which is it's probably one of the most sort of open and transverse skill sets you can have. Um, and, you know, that happens to suit me very well because I like doing a lot of different things. Um, and I think for me, um, you know, I'd worked in, uh, uh, in three early stage startups. Um, so sort of all at the, the sort of, you know, raised a little bit of money and getting to the point of scaling. I'd worked at sort of three successive startups in that stage, starting to grow into sort of bigger companies. Um, and uh, we, were, we were very lucky with the last company I worked at and that we had a very successful acquisition, um, which sort of led to a new era of things. Um, and so it was a really sort of timely moment for me to say, well, well, what is it I want to do next? Um, and you sort of talk about these cycles. Most people sort of do like seven year cycles. I'd been in tech for about six and a half years at that point. Um, and the logical thing that most people thought I would do would be to start my own tech company, um, which uh, definitely was one of the options uh, on the cards. Um, but I think context is always important. It's the number one thing I always said as a HR um, director, which is there is no one size fits all when it comes to people. Um, and the context was that we'd just come out of, I, I would say, the most full on two years of the, of the pandemic. Um, we've been through an acquisition, anyone who's even been close to one of those knows kind of the level of uh, of work that's involved in that. Um, and so there was context to that. And, you know, everybody had been working on Zoom for, for two years. I got into people things because I like people. I like, you know, I'm fascinated by them. I like meeting them in person and reading body language and understanding group dynamics in a room. And um, whilst the essence of the work can translate to Zoom, the fun of it didn't for me. Um and so I think what I really wanted was in the backlash of full remote was to have a physical fixed space. Um, I wanted uh, to basically stay in one place and have people know where they could find me day in and day out. And I wanted to create a physical space that made other people feel good. We've been inside our homes or we've been traveling or we've been a bit kind of floating for, for, for two and a half years. And I felt like people wanted to, you know, we've been ordering on Amazon. People wanted to come back and have this kind of community space. Um, and so I was kind of obsessed with this idea about working, you know, face to face in one fixed spot. Um, and, you know, sort of after five to six years of hiring a lot um, and managing teams and often managing people outside of my own teams and, and doing a lot of handholding for for want of a better word. I, I kind of, I didn't really want to do that. And I thought, well, what, what can you do that's in a physical space where you work by yourself, for yourself? And I thought, oh, great, brilliant, Alison, you've just invented, you know, brick and mortar retail. Um, and so <laughs> that's kind of how we landed on it. <laughs> but wine, I mean, you could have, you could have opened a bookstore, you could have done any number of things. So clearly this is a passion that, you know, was... Uh, existent. Yeah. So I, I sort of like to say that the Cavewoman um, idea came to me on Christmas Day 2021. So so just over a year ago. Um, and in many ways it did. I was reading a book uh, by an American author and uh, winemaker, Rachel Signer, um, called You Had Me at Pet Nat, um, which actually I'm excited to soon have in store next to your book. Um, and basically there's a line in the book I'm paraphrasing, but uh, basically uh, uh, Rachel says, oh, what if we opened a wine bar in Paris? And I was sort of sitting there in Australia on Christmas Day and I went, well, yeah, w what if I did that? And then I went, well, maybe not a bar, but a, but a store. And it was the first idea, um, you know, sort of in three months um, or where I'd sort of let myself float and exploring things that kind of took hold and took root. Um, and, you know, what was interesting was then the reactions of people. I spent all of January, and I recommend this approach if you're thinking about a big shift, um, just take a month and pretend like you've already made the decision and then just kind of operate according to that new reality. So I would just tell everyone knew who I met, um, you know, sort of inconsequential, you know, the postman or your baker. Or, you know, I would just sort of say, look, when it came up, what do you do? I'd say, oh, I'm, I'm a cabist. Uh, and I would just kind of see how that felt. You know, I don't encourage lying to people, but it's a good way to kind of try on a new life. Um, <laughs> and what was fun is in that sort of January of telling people, um, you know, people I just met, friends, um, new friends, friends I'd had for decades, um, the mix of reactions. I either got the, oh, wow, that comes totally out of left field um, from people who maybe knew me through tech or things like that. And from friends who I've sort of had for, for, you know, 20 plus years, they said, oh, well, of course. Um, and they sort of knew something that I didn't, which is I've more or less been talking around this idea, you know, probably since I was about 15 years old. Um, not necessarily in this format, um, but I always sort of wanted to either run a bed and breakfast or 
um, you know, run a restaurant, um, and, you know, definitely a bookstore was in the mix, um, and all of these things. So there was a sort of subset of people who went, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and, you know, I had well, a lot of very sp- Right. Yeah. Because I was going to say wine is very specific. You don't just sort of, you know, pick that out of a hat. Yeah, absolutely. The thing, maybe one of my problems is I love a lot of things. And so narrowing it down, um, you know, there was this kind of logical process. And then the wine side of things, I do love wine. I'm very interested in wine. Um, but, and this is where I guess the tech uh, and the startup uh, training, for want of a better word, um, exposure is maybe a better word, uh, comes in, which is there was an opportunity in wine. And the opportunity in wine, uh, you know, I'm somebody who likes wine, who buys wine, who has, you know, sort of three, four cabinets uh, I'm on a first name basis with, and that's always been true in Paris. And yet there was this gap in that industry, which is if you are an expat um, in Paris and you like wine, chances are by default you'll be treated as a tourist in the wine store. Um, hmm. And and that was really frustrating um, for me. Uh, you know, that's why the few cabbers who I went to regularly, I'd sort of, you know, after about 10 visits, we'd gotten over that hurdle of, um, you know, them assuming that I was in town for two weeks and not 10 years. Um, you're having by default trying to calibrate to a palate that wasn't French, even though I'd only been drinking French wine for, for a decade. Um and just generally, you know, a language barrier that despite being fluent in French, um, I found maybe a cultural barrier that stopped me, I felt, from getting the best kind of wine service at some of the, mm. the, the French wine stores. And also, you know, it left me feeling you go in to buy a bottle of wine and you'd walk out feeling maybe a little bit silly, um, you know, or, or like you didn't really understand things or you'd walk out with a bottle that wasn't exactly what you wanted. Well, um, you know, no one really likes feeling like they were either taken advantage of or given sort of base level, like phoned in service where, you know, they didn't really take the time to figure out what your tastes are, what you're really looking for. And so they just, they kind of don't put much thought into it. And I've bought a number of bottles in that way. And whether or not it's because they think that I don't, you know, sometimes I don't even think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nationality thing or a, um, it, it's really a, you're a female and you sound like maybe you're not sure of what you like. And so therefore I'm going to treat you as a total, uh, sort of ignoramus, you know, like you, you really don't know. So I'm just going to push whatever. And obviously that's not why, I, I mean, I can't, I wouldn't say that's true for all Kevist, but certainly there's, you know, there's a reason that there have been women who have gotten into this industry because they understand there's a, there's a discrepancy, not a, dis- well, I wouldn't say that. Maybe it's, it's a, it's a, it's a different comfort level in speaking about wine and in navigating that, especially when men are present. That's why Cynthia Coutu, who I think you know, um, who I've had on this show previously, wanted to do something around champagne for women because she sort of polled a whole number of people and, and, and discovered that women actually won't speak up if they're in a sort of tasting experience with men. Um, so the confidence level, you know, I think we probably show that maybe if, you know, we go into a wine store and we don't feel super confident, then, you know, the reaction on the other side is going to be, well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so I think- so you, you tapped into this as well, though, with your store. It's not even just the service. It's also the female element. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, once again, the parallel with the tech industry, I spent a lot of years often being the only woman at an executive table or the only woman in the room, uh, or in some extreme cases, the only woman in the company. Um, and that positioning, uh, you know, depending who you're working with, uh, can be either, you know, a little bit frustrating or it can be downright, um, you know, unpleasant. And, I felt that, um, and you know, this was very true in tech as well, in, in, in general, in organizations and in companies, um, if you don't have this sort of culture of, of psychological safety, um, you make it very difficult to build a positive culture. Um, and that then has all these flow on effects. Um, basically, if you're not allowed to say, I don't know, um, hmm. you have all of these second order effects that come out of ego and, and misplaced ego and that can create really dangerous effects for, you know, society and companies and things like that. And I think I wanted to bring that through into Cave Woman. I think I wanted to make, you know, the physical store of Cave Woman and everything kind of associated with the brands, um, you know, this kind of place where there was psychological safety. You could walk in and a lot of people do walk in and it makes, it's my favorite thing to hear people walk in the store and they say, oh, I don't really know much about wine. I go, well, that's great. That's what I'm here for. Um, you know, you've done the hard thing, which is like push the door, come inside and, and that. Um, and the secret about wine is that you actually 
you don't need to know a ton about wine to end up with good wine. Um, what you need to know is, is yourself. Um, and basically you need to know a little bit about yourself, about the things you like. Um, and that might be taste wise, or that might be just in general, that might be a mood. Um, you know, there's a, uh, there's a, a, a writer, um, um, who's also a Rachel, um, on Twitter who does these like perfume genie, um, things oh, where she of basically course. says, yes, yes, yes. She writes for the New yes. Yorker. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Where she gives, she kind of says, you know, like, give me a mood and I'll find you a perfume. And, and, and I really like that approach, um, for wine, which is, you know, you might know nothing about, mar about wine. You might not know what kind of regions, or what kind of grapes, or what kind of taste you're after, but you can probably tell me, you know, who you're going to drink it with and in wh which context. Um, and that context is enough for me to recommend something. You know, I have a regular who comes in and he says, Oh, you know, look, it's Tuesday night and I have to do the vacuuming and I hate vacuuming. And I'm like, that's fine. We have a wine for that. And it's true. And it's, and it's, it's not the same wine you're going to put on your Christmas table, probably with friends. It's not the same wine you'll offer maybe to your father-in-law as a present, but we have wine that's really situation specific. So, it, you know, I might ask one or two clarifying questions, um, but I already have enough information to probably give you a bottle that you're going to be happy with. A and vacuuming I, wine. Uh, that's, a, that's a total new one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's what I kind of wanted to create. I wanted to, you know, wine at the, wine is, it's grape juice, right? Like we don't need to get so oh, but you know, people sort of want to up about yeah, it. Yeah, but people want to intellectualize it. They need to, you know, create a whole elite club around it because you know this is what people do. They, 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 they we're tribal and we create sort of like, well, I'm in the the wine club and you're in the food club and then whatever. I mean, it's but unfortunately, it's very exclusionary. Uh, yeah, and I think that's I think that's it. I think it's the gatekeepery side of it that has never appealed to me. It never appealed to me in tech either, and there's plenty of that. Um, and I think the, the good news is you can break down so many of those barriers, not by force, not by coming in, not by saying, look at all my knowledge. Um, you can come in by kind of listening, um, you know, and, and, and by being vulnerable yourself. You know, I'm the first one to say there's there's certainly things I don't know about wine. Otherwise, I, you know, I probably wouldn't go into an industry that I already knew everything about. How boring. Um, you know, there's so many things to learn. But you did, I think you did do fun. a training, didn't you? Uh, one of the certification yeah. exams or programs. Yeah, WSET, uh, which is the kind of British uh, authority on on wine, um, which I know to some French ears, you know, uh, <laughs> it might be a little bit surprising. Basically, it's the only um, qualification, at least for the retail wine side of things, that's recognized internationally. And so I basically wanted the portability of that. So that has three levels before the diploma. So I've done level two and currently uh, preparing for level three as we speak. But let's go back to the the collection of wines that you have, because there's a, a clear female focus, not, uh, not, not just in, in terms of trying to have female winemakers, but if there aren't female winemakers uh, that you're carrying, you're looking for certain other criteria. What are they? Yeah, basically all the wines in the store are either made by women, um, or the domain, uh, basically is owned at least 50% by a woman. So meaning like economic, um, control. So in some cases, you know, I have some people sort of come in and, and, and I like this. They'll kind of come in and they go, well, well, that domain's, there's no women in that domain. And I'll kind of say, well, yes, actually the grandmother still owns economically the entire domain, even though it's the two grandsons who are running it today. Yep. You're absolutely right. Um, and if that then forces people to think or provokes them to think a bit more about who's making the things they consume, I think that's great. Um, we're not categoric either. Um, we have some male winemakers and some male-owned domains in the store. It's definitely not the majority. Um, and, uh, you know, basically what I thought was if I'm going to be working solo um, and if my work, you know, we, we essentially, if we on-sell other people's wine, right? Um, if I'm going to be enriching other people um how can i kind of be thoughtful about that and i thought well i work solo but i'd love to be surrounded by the work of other fantastic women and if i'm making money well by de facto who am i redirecting that money to and what does that look like and i wanted that to be a majority women because that was one thing that i struggled to reconcile in tech which was you know, my job was to help companies succeed. Um, if we did succeed, the yes, of course, there's the products we brought to market, um, you know, which uh, the products I worked with, we wanted to do more good in the world, obviously, than evil. So I was very selective around that. But at the end of the day, if you have a successful tech IPO or a successful exit, um, and the, the team is a majority of white male um, engineers who are already very overrepresented, at, you know, I sort of, it was a slightly hollow victory for me to make, uh, to enrich people who actually didn't really need my help. Um, and, and shareholders. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Probably a lot of male shareholders, yeah. I, exactly. You know, I was lucky enough at our last startup that our lead investor uh, was a woman and we were thrilled, to, you know, absolutely thrilled to work with her and, and love everything that she's doing and we were thoughtful about it. But the reality is the majority, uh, it's still going to be that kind of uh, stereotypical um, uh, sort of overrepresented white man. And, and I just thought how... You know, you could kind of say, obviously, in a tech company that's worth millions, there's a much larger uh, impact than in a small wine store. But I don't think there are small um, impacts. I think it's sort of to do with your process and 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 how you go about that. Um, and you know, my goal I, today it's a differentiator that we stock mostly female winemakers. Which for me, I hope in a couple of years is just wild that that was ever a thing. I hope that just every cavist is sort of by default doing at least a fifty fifty selection, and we just don't talk about it anymore. But it, you know, that's my hope in any case. Well, unfortunately, we need to be very intentional about some of these things in all businesses um, until it becomes automatic. Mm. Um, but, you know, it, it is sad to think that after all this time of fighting and, you know, everything, it's uh, we're not we're not quite there yet. But whatever we're, we're, we're talking about in, in this in the span of an entire lifetime of human existence, mm. this is still, you know, a, a blip in in that in that experience. But, yeah, we like to hope it's going to move forward a little bit faster. Um, I'm, I, I really want to get to something that I think our listeners will, um, our listeners, I don't, I'm not a team, by the way, I don't know why I said our, uh, <laughs> um, are, are curious about, which is, you know, what are some of the, who are some of the producers that you, you stock that you recommend strongly, whether it's, you know, because they sort of uh, cater to uh, a variety of tastes or because they have a particular viticultural uh, process that you really respect? You know, like who are some of the few that you're you're really excited about? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I could probably sort of talk all day and anyone who sort of comes into the store knows that um, I can be a bit fickle with my favorites and I'll say, well, this is my absolute favorite wine this week. Um, and that comes with the, you know, that comes a bit with the territory. I love all of my wines and my producers, but you know, there's seasons and things like that. I think, um, you know, I think one of the, the producers that I'm really excited about, um, Cecile Dardanelli and her daughter, Laura, um, basically they've got, their domain is in Beaujolais. Um, and Beaujolais I find is really kind of misunderstood by French people and uh, expats alike. Um, everybody says, here's Beaujolais and thinks, oh, Beaujolais Nouveau, the kind of earliest wine that they release. They think cheap. They're probably correlating with a, an experience of drinking a supermarket, sort of three, four euro bottle of Beaujolais Nouveau and the, you know, probably likely headache, um, that they had, uh, you know, the day after. Um, so what I really like about the region in Beaujolais, what a lot of people don't realize. So Beaujolais is very close, uh, geographically to Bourgogne, uh, Burgundy. Mm -hmm. Burgundy commands some of the highest prices for light bodied red wines, uh, in the world. Um, and Beaujolais is, you know, the very, you know, sort of uh, edges of Beaujolais and Burgundy, you know, there's a few kilometers in it. Um, and whilst they're not using the same grape varieties in Beaujolais, it's entirely Gamay on the red side. Um, people who like the profile of a Burgundy red, um, particularly some of the younger ones, will absolutely love a Beaujolais red and for likely half the price. Um, and I always think that's the role of the caviar. You know, any, anybody can, with a high enough budget, anyone can get great wine. Um, the real party trick is finding great wine at great prices. Um, and, you know, I always sort of say to people at the Cavius, the best question you could probably ask is what's a wine that you think overperforms for its price point? Um, and uh, because we all, we can, we've probably got three in mind, you know, any other fellow Cavius listening to this would be like, oh yeah, I know, I know exactly which wine I'd recommend. Um, because price. That's a great can, question. Yeah. And it can be a really good indicator of, in some things, but, you know, there's market demand forces. So I really like Beaujolais and I really like Sissi Lenora and the work that they do. Um, you know, I have something like five or six references from them, which in Beaujolais, it's all Gamay. Um, it's a region that people don't necessarily come in off the bat and ask about. So that kind of sort of the work speaks for itself. Um, but I had their, um, Beaujolais Nouveau this year. I stocked it. Um, and. You know, it was a month long of November of people saying to, you know, people coming in, seeing the bottle and saying, oh, oh, it's all rubbish, isn't it? And I kind of said, well, you know what? Think about it this way. You know, um, Cecile and Laura, they like they don't need uh, they don't need to make a Beaujolais Nouveau to make their kind of your know, economics work. They've got all you know these five, six other appellations that they work with that they're successful at. They have a reputation. Their name is on the bottle, right? They're not on selling their grapes to someone else to bottle it behind a, you know, a different label. I, 
if you're an independent producer, you're going to put out a wine that you're not proud to put out. And I said, look, you know, that, that's my thinking on things, you know, and, and, and it's still small batch and, you know, they're not selling to supermarkets and things like that. And I said, look, worst case, try it. You know, it's an inexpensive wine. Um, and, and tell me what you think. And, you know, I think I had something like 10 different customers, expats, French people all mixed together who, you know, sort of went out of the way to write to me on Instagram or text me to say, you know, in all my time, and these are people who've been, you know, drinking wine a little bit longer than I have, you know, and in all their time, they'd never had a Beaujolais Nouveau that they enjoyed and they enjoyed this one. Um, and mm. I love that kind of victory, which is around getting people to understand how, you know, it goes from grapes in the field to a bottle in your hand and how the less intermediaries and the more kind of artisanal you have, the more likely it is you're getting actually decent quality. Um, so I like that because they've sort of helped me convince a lot of people, not only on Beaujolais Nouveau, but on all their other wines, people sort of come back in and go, oh, yeah, I'll just get four of those. Like what great value to, uh, to have. And um, I've always been one for the underdog. And I feel like Beaujolais, a little bit like Alsace, are some of those regions that could, particularly in Paris, they could use a bit of a helping hand. Um, You're so, right. Yeah. And what about, uh, is there anything in sort of... Um, uh, I don't know a southern region uh, for wine that you're that you're into. Yeah, so there's a there's a winemaker I started working with, um, you know, late last year. Her name is Aurélie Tailleux, um, and she goes by well her wine label and, and otherwise her moniker is La Fille La Fille des Vines, um, uh, which I really like. So essentially, vine girl or wine girl, depending on your translation. Um, and she's taken back over uh, her family, uh, her father's domain in Cote d'Or. Um, and what I really like is she makes uh, incredible, affordable Cote d'Or uh, wines. She has a Cote d'Or and a Cote d'Or village and a Cote d'Or blanc, uh, so a white wine, which uh, not a ton of people have tried that much of the Cote d'Or blanc. No, I don't think I uh, ever have. Yeah, incredibly affordable. Um, as soon as she releases her her new batch uh, in April, uh, I'll be placing a big order on the white, but we still have the reds. Um and she's, you know, certified organic, um, which is something that a lot of people are looking for these days. Um, and being certified organic has a ton of constraints, a ton of costs on the winemaker's side. So it's not something they take lightly. Um, it takes sort of six, seven years to get certified. Um, and the fact that, you know, we're still talking about under 15 euros retail uh, bottle um, for an organic certified small batch independent uh, winemaker, for me, that's one of the best value wines that we have in store it's also incredibly well handled so basically rule of thumb the more sunshine the more alcohol um, to keep it really simple so the further south you go in france the you sort of fuller body more alcoholic wines you get the further north the colder it is the lighter so for you know wines that are creeping up to 15 percent um alcohol you don't feel that alcohol at all. Um, so that's that's quite a skill from a winemaking point of view. It means that it needs to come with a warning, which is snack with it, snack heavily at least. Um, <laughs> but it, that's what I love. You know, there you don't feel that as particularly well integrated. Even the you know the tannins and things like that are really sort of masterfully done. So I really like working with Aurelie. She also has some olive groves, um, and we're hopeful if if the weather is kind to us uh, in the coming years that we'll be able to get some of her olive oil, which she does in wine bottles, which is just a gorgeous gift. Um, and some of her like tapenade and things like that. Um, so yeah, Aurélie Tailleur and Cécile and Laura Dardanetti would be a, a couple of my picks. Although there's you know about fifteen of others. Of course, I'd love to, of course. And I will about. I will put them in the in the show notes, the show description. Um, I just wanted to say as well, you do carry a couple of Australian wines, or maybe one Australian wine, as sort of a nod to your heritage. Not you know the idea is not to be a uh, you know a total international uh, caviste, right? I mean, you really are focused on France. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when I opened, I thought, uh, I definitely, well, A, when I opened, we were sort of having, still are, I guess, an energy crisis. There was, you know, a lot of uh, supply chain and logistics issues. And I thought, you know, what a pity to live in France where you've got driving distance to some of the best wines in the world and, you know, be looking elsewhere. Um, but I did want to make sure sort of that Australia was represented. Um, a lot of French people spend time in Australia. Um, it really is one of those, particularly sort of for, for, for the younger generations, it is really one of those places that, you know, people dream of and often they've sort of had an opportunity with like a working holiday visa or things like that. Um, so it is kind of a, a, a link. Um, and so I thought I just wanted to have sort of four or five references for Australian wine, working with independent producers, um, generally couples uh, in this instance. Um, there are a few female winemakers I'd love to represent. We're still working on the logistics of, of getting sort of small batches across, um, which is an ongoing post-Brexit challenge as well. 
Um, but basically we, it, what I wanted to do, I have a, a particularly sort of emblematic red, um, which is this Turkey Flat Vineyards 2017 Shiraz, um, which I anecdotally sell at the same price as you would find for retail in Australia. And that one, uh, you know, I kind of laugh, French customers ask me about it and I say, oh, that one's just for Australian expats. Um, and they kind of look at me like, what do you mean? I say, well, well, you know, if you're going to spend sort of 40 plus euros on a bottle, and you're French, I'd sort of have to steer you towards a Burgundy or, 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 or Bordeaux or something where you know the value. I'm like, this is, I'm like, this is a great wine and it, and it merits its price, but you know, you might not get it. Um, and interestingly enough, I have French customers who come back and they say, no, I still want a bottle of that Australian wine, please. Um, it's just such a different, um, Australian Shiraz is such a different profile to French Syrah that, um, it's almost, it, you, you just want to treat them as if they're two different grape varieties uh, mm. to get your head around it. Um, but I've had some really good feedback and I have a, a regular French customer who's coming back in this week, I think, to pick up two or three of those. So, um, you just convert them you know, slowly. slowly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Exactly. And I think that's actually, you know, how many other cavistes would maybe take the time to, issue a warning to their, to their clients. Like, <laughs> no, don't spend 40 euros if you're not, you know, if you're really not sure. I don't know. I just think there's a thoughtfulness there that, you know, especially as, you know, th- things are getting more expensive, you want to be sure of how you're spending your money. So that's very thoughtful. Yeah. Um, and, you know, retail, I, I've never thought retail was transactional and I don't think it should be. Um, you could always make a, you could always upsell on a one-off transaction that's always true in, in whatever you're doing but you know it's it's loyalty that we're interested in over time yeah, and, it's relationship building yeah, and so yeah, yeah. Exactly. so i'm not surprised to hear you already have a slew of regulars i know um uh, there have been some travelers i've sent your way um and i was glad that they they did that and i just to add you know i know you you have to actually leave soon to go open the shop uh just so <laughs> listeners know you know she's really <laughs> dedicated to that store um you do run workshops and tastings at the store because you have this beautiful space that has, um, you know, a room dedicated with a gorgeous communal table. Um, so that's another way to get involved. If people want to, to learn and not just come talk to you and buy a bottle, they can also stay a little longer and participate in one of these workshops, which you do announce on your website. Um, what else, what do you have coming up that people could maybe get excited about? We're, we're early Feb. This, this episode's going to run imminently so is there anything coming up this month uh, or in march that uh, people can look forward to yeah absolutely you know it was a bit of a gamble to take on such a big retail space when i say big and you come into the store if you're not from paris believe me when i say it's a big store um it might not be big by australian or american standards um but we have this sort of large communal table out the back because i did want that feeling of community um and i wanted it to be a space where people could meet other people i didn't want it to be You know, it's nice to have your regulars and regulars who know me, but I'm more excited when my regulars know each other um, and when they find, you know, often their neighbors, um, if they're coming to the store regularly or there's something in common. Um, And so our events, whilst generally there's an educational flavor, it's really more about community and meeting people and like-minded people. Um, you know, I serve a lot of the expat community and, and, you know, we don't have the same sort of family and friendship structures as, as people who've lived in Paris their entire life do. And, and I wanted it to be another sort of meeting place. So we've started, we've tested a range of events over the last six months and they've all been incredibly well received, which I'm, I'm sort of just happily surprised about and really grateful for. But, um, one format we've started doing, which is our Sunday lunches. So we're closed on Sundays. Um, but, you know, sort of one Sunday lunch uh, every few months at the moment, we're doing it monthly. Um, we sort of just have 10 spots at the communal table. I eat with you. You know, it's not a sort of, it's we're not a restaurant. We bring in food from the outside. We have some great wine. Um, we usually schedule it to run for a couple of hours. It's rare that it runs for anything under four hours. Um, everyone sort of leaves with, with new friends and plans and, and, and things like that. And that's been really fun. Um so we have one of those coming up on the 5th of March um, and our big February event actually is an alternative to Valentine's Day. So the concept's called Galentine's Day, so Valentine's Day with the gals. Um, basically, you know, in France, actually like everywhere, I think Valentine's Day isn't necessarily something that everybody universally is excited about celebrating, whether they're coupled up or, or single or, or somewhere in between. Um, and so I wanted to give an alternative to that. So Basically, what we're doing at the CAV, we're going to bring in, uh, there's this wine collective called Vin et Volet, um, which basically they, amongst a great many other things, they commission um, these specific um, wine vintages that are um, then labeled with some kind of provocative labeling um, and a percentage of uh, sales from those wines goes to uh, charities, um, particularly sort of helping, you know, anti um 
uh, violence against women and anti-racism and things like that. Um, so they're coming in to actually uh, pour sort of three of their wines. One of their wines is called Self Love, which is uh, by Justine Vigne, who's another winemaker I adore, and it's perfect for the occasion. Um, do their wines. We're collaborating with one of my favorite bars in the area, Dirty Lemon, um, who are going to do, uh, who's a cocktail, female owned and run cocktail bar. They're going to do us their sort of famous bar snacks, um, on the night. We're going to do tarot reading. Um, my massage therapist, uh, <laughs> Melanie Lowe is coming in to do mini massages. Um, and probably about five other things I've forgotten. But the idea is a little bit like, um, going into kind of like an arcade or a carnival hall. Like, uh, when you're, when you're a kid and there's like a massage station, there's a tarot reading station, grab a glass of wine, have some snacks and kind of mingle. So we're hoping it'll be a bit of happy chaos. So that's the 14th, uh, Tuesday, the 14th of Feb. Uh, and you can sign up on the website or, uh, via Instagram. I mean, wow, you've got a lot going on in, you know, and you haven't even been open a year. So, you know, congratulations to you. I do think that's a testament to, and not only the idea, the space, what you've done with the space, and also your uh, clear gift with people, um, which, you know, I, I do think the the transition from uh, human resources to this is is actually not quite as surprising, as, as surprising as one might initially think. So kudos to you. I hope everyone listening gets to Paris and, and, and stops by and talks to you and gets one of your suggestions for wine. Um, and so you can find Allison at Cave Woman Wines. It's in the 11th arrondissement. Uh, and she is online. So find her, look her up. And uh, Allison, looking forward to sharing a glass with you soon. Thanks, Lindsay. That's the show for today. As always, thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing with friends. You can find all previous episodes of the New Paris podcast wherever you stream your podcasts and on World Radio Paris. If you're enjoying these conversations, please consider picking up a copy of the New Paris book or my recent release, The New Parisienne, from your local booksellers. Until next time, à bientôt.